Cool. So again, thank you so much for everybody for joining us. My name is Laura Luopa. I am a librarian with eCampus Ontario. Joining us today are Shauna and Catherine from Fanshawe College, who will be sharing their experience with OERs and accessibility. This is part of an ongoing series that will continue into next week. So if you're interested in learning more about accessibility topics, please take the opportunity to look at the Open Library website. There are three more sessions that will be taking place. Before we begin today and hand it over to our facilitators, I'd like to take a moment to share a land acknowledgement. The offices of eCampus Ontario are located in downtown Toronto and are within the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. I am joining the session today from Sudbury, which is on the traditional lands of the Anishabe people of Turtle Island, the Atikamishing, the Anishawabek, and I'd like to recognize the Wanapate First Nation and the Métis Nation of Ontario. My colleagues will have dropped a link to some land acknowledgements and information regarding land acknowledgements in the chat. Please feel free to take the opportunity to share your own land acknowledgement in the chat as well. Thank you. And now uh, it's with my pleasure to pass this over to Shauna and Catherine, who will be facilitating the session today. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session on exploring inclusivity in OER from a design perspective. And we call this a conversation uh, because we're really hoping that uh, everyone will be able to join in and participate. The intention of this session is to discuss the design of inclusive and open educational resources for teaching and learning. We acknowledge that we are not experts on inclusive design, but we are designers committed to expanding our understanding of the impacts of design choices on learners. And our goal is really to create an environment where we can exchange ideas, confront challenges, and discover solutions, which will enable us to grow and enhance our contributions to education. We were just actually talking before this session about how these last two sessions have been really helpful because I think sometimes, you know, we're reading all of the resources online, but, it, you know, if we're not having a conversation about how to implement those resources in some respects, um, you know, it doesn't work as well. Uh, so I'm really happy that eCampus is offering uh, these sessions and we want to thank them uh, for opening this conversation. So as Laura said, my name is Shauna Roche and I'm a faculty member and the project lead of the OER Design Studio at Fanshawe College. And I'm joined by my colleague, and I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Catherine Steves, and I am the uh, an, an instructional designer in our studio. Um, and I'm happy to be here with you today. And of course, I forgot to advance to our lovely pictures. <laughs> So as I mentioned for our session today, um, you know, we're going to talk about uh, some of the things that we've experienced, but we really want to open up the conversation. Uh, we're going to start with just providing a quick overview of our studio and our processes so that you can understand our context um, and where we're coming from and our experience. Uh, then we'll engage in a conversation to understand, you know, where each of us is at in terms of our journey to make educational resources more inclusive. Our intention is not to cover all aspects of inclusive de design. We may, uh, you know, just based on our conversations, uh, but we're hoping to touch on, you know, key areas, best practices, and just share what we've learned. So the OER Design Studio at Fanshawe started in May 2021 with the support from the eCampus Ontario VLS uh, Phase 1 funding uh, that we were very happy to get. And our mission is to transform teaching and learning through open practices, and our vision is open learning uh, leading change. I just wanted to include the slide on the SDGs. So if you don't know, the United Nations has developed a set of 17 Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, that provide a blueprint for peace and prosperity for people in the planet. Uh, specifically, we're looking at sustainable development goal number four, uh, which is um, to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong uh, learning opportunities for all. And so this is the one I think that ties in so very nicely with OERs. 
And OERs help achieve this goal by increasing access and equity, reducing cost, improving the quality of the resources, supporting digital literacy, facilitating collaboration and, and customization, and encouraging lifelong learning. So the studio at Fanshawe provides a full wraparound support to faculty and staff uh, looking to adopt or create uh, OER. So we do this by promoting the use of open educational resources to educators, uh, create high quality learner focused materials uh, in conjunction with faculty and staff, reduce barriers through equitable access, foster a sense of community and collaboration, which I think is a really key piece, and provide experiential learning opportunities for students. I just wanted to include that our studio team, uh, it really just includes Catherine and myself and a diverse group of students. Uh, serving in various roles. And just again, to provide some context, uh, you know, our team is largely uh, consists of students. And because of that, they change very frequently. So there's a really heightened importance uh, for us to establish standardized pr processes and procedures and methodologies, um, as well as, you know, really kind of creating training supports to ensure that consistency and to improve the quality and accessibility of our resources. So just some background, uh, we, since our inception in 2021, uh, we've received over 215 uh, requests for more information, usually environmental scans. We've awarded 38 grants, developed 75 open resources, and we've done this by employing what we would like to call an agile process. Uh, so we take on new projects each semester with a development timeline of approximately 14 weeks. So this is a very rapid uh, development process and very different from a lot of places uh, in North America. And this really, again, highlights our need to be efficient and to have that consistency in training and in our approach. So I want to say something here that it I, I call this a journey because it really has been a journey for us. You know, we we kind of flew into the process and had a lot of interest. And so, you know, we didn't want to turn anybody away. So we've really embraced uh, any project that has come our way. But when we look at our journey from, you know, where we are now and go back to some of our uh, original books that we created, we can definitely see that there's a lot of improvements, you know, that need to be made. And so we have uh, instituted a bit of a, a process around bringing up, you know, some of our older resources that we created to, to our new standards. And it's a spreadsheet essentially that I think keeps growing by the minute as Catherine will probably attest to. Every time we discover something else that's missing, we add it to the spreadsheet. And then that spreadsheet gets applied to, to all new projects. Uh, and then when we have time, we go back and remedy some of the issues with uh, the ones that we did in the, in the beginning. To start the conversation today, I thought we would share this definition of inclusive design by the Inclusive Design Research Center. So it says inclusive design is design that considers the full range of human diversity with respect to ability, language, culture, gender, age, and any other forms of human difference, which really is a lot. So based on this definition and our own understanding of the topic, we would like to know how confident you feel in your knowledge of inclusive design with respect to designing uh, educational uh, resources. And I just realized that I did not set the poll up. So it might be best if we just use the chat to share our responses. So how confident do you feel? Fairly confident, number two, confident, number one, or not confident, three. if you feel comfortable sharing. So I think based on the chat, it seems like we're all in the same boat, right? You know, we don't feel super confident uh, about this topic. And I think that's because it's evolving and we're learning as we go as well. 
And so that that's wonderful that we're all in this position and we can we can learn from each other. All right, I'm going to pass it over to Catherine to go through the next slide. So um, in our studio, as we are sort of on this, this path to inclusivity, um, we recognize that every single learner is different and that they'll engage with the content in a different way. Um, as Shauna mentioned, our approach has really has been evolving and is continuing to evolve um, as we learn more about how to ensure everyone has the opportunity to engage. Um, we're learning from the wider community, our community, and our learners, and um, our process is iterative. So each time we learn something, then we have the opportunity to learn the next piece um, and implement it into this continuous uh, improvement process. So this next part um, is part of the conversation and we'd love to hear from you all. Um, so we have a couple of questions and um, there's some different ways that that you can engage. Uh, you can please feel free to unmute and share your thoughts and experiences. You can contribute in the chat feature. Um, and we've also created this collaborative Google document. Um, so we can we will share the link. And um, so you can feel free to include your thoughts um, in that in that document as well. So we've uh, brought up three questions to sort of start the conversation off. Uh, question one, what challenges have you encountered with ensuring accessible design and educational resources? Question two, what have you learned that you want to share with others? And question three, what resources have been helpful to you in your inclusive design journey? So the link to the Google Doc is now in the chat. Um, and we, we would love to hear about people's experiences um, and and elements that they're wanting to share with the group. I love the first one that's already come up. <laughs> and this is this is something that is uh, yeah, very near and dear to us uh, in the studio. You know, working with, uh, working with faculty and we'll talk a little bit about some of the different challenges uh, we've experienced uh, later and you know faculty have these amazing ideas for design and we have to balance that sometimes against what we know is not great inclusive design and it often is a conversation um, about you know why why we would want to do it differently and trying to find uh, another way of approaching it. Yes, and again, the lack of understanding um, of inclusive and accessible design. And it's, again, often where we're encountering this because uh, we work with faculty on a week-by-week -week basis. I should have mentioned this in the beginning as well. So when we're approaching, you know, say, the creation of a textbook, we create an overall structure for that book. Uh, and then each week, the person we're working with, the subject matter expert, is delivering that chapter. And so we do this in a Google Doc or, you know, through Microsoft 365 so that we're able to kind of pop in and out as they're designing their chapter. And often we'll see things that, you know, maybe we know, uh, you know, won't work. Uh, and so that's an opportunity for us to kind of pop in and make some comments to say, have you thought about this instead? And this is the reason why. And I think a lot of times, most faculty want, obviously want to make this the best that they can, right? And so they just didn't know. And so having that concrete example and that opportunity to have that conversation uh, at the time is really beneficial. Yes, time constraints are such a rapid development process. Um, Sometimes it can be, I hope I'm coming through okay. I can seem to be laggy in my video. Am I okay there, Catherine? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just making some weird facial gestures. <laughs> um, yeah, so time constraints is a, is a big one for us. And again, it's really necessitating that consistent approach because 
we found when we were first starting out, you know, we're like, oh, yeah, let's do it this way. Or sometimes we were taking the lead from a book we had adapted from. And maybe it wasn't, you know, necessarily as inclusive as it could be. And so then we were developing sometimes some standards throughout the process. And we know that's not the best approach, right? You know, so having those standards uh, to be able to do projects fresh is always really nice. Funding restraints, lack of support from upper management. You know, these are all really, really big challenges, right? And sometimes difficult to come up with uh, solutions. When we're coming, when we're facing time constraints and funding, you know, again, any ways to increase efficiency, right? So, you know, leveraging uh, different programs. We'll share some things that uh, our students have uh, created. So different they've created, we share on our GitHub page. You know, a lot of things that where we require, you know, formatting and that kind of thing. So that can help. Um, compiling all the criteria we need to apply because mm -hmm. the information is dispersed. And this is what we found too, eh, Catherine? Yeah. Um, big. <laughs> That's been a huge one, just trying to yeah access all the like different pieces from all these different sources and how do we bring them all together. And as soon as sort of we found one way someone comes across an article or they attend a session and we learn a new thing and then we've to include that and, and layer that in as well. And I would say, and I don't, I don't know if there's a resource that exists actually right now, but I think, you know, as I'm even going through some of the, the challenges that you've listed, it would be wonderful to have, you know, something very kind of maybe short and concise that gave some real concrete examples of issues uh, and then have it link out maybe to more information, something that's easily digestible uh, might be helpful too. Maybe something that needs to be created. If anybody else wants to add anything else, please feel free to add to the chat. Yes, yeah, Sophie. It's hard. I feel, I feel it myself that you know, even though a lot of the resources are there and there's some amazing books that have been created, I don't know what it is. Sometimes I don't want to read through all of it. <laughs> I, 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 you know, myself need something kind of, you know, summarized, right? So what have you learned that you want to share with others? Making control lists helps to remember and not mm -hmm. feel overwhelmed. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? You don't have to, maybe if you want to add to the chat as well. Do you mean like a list so that you can apply that now to each and every project? I'm assuming. And that's kind of what we're doing with, with our spreadsheet that keeps growing. Um, is every time we think of something that we've missed, you know, like I said, we add it in uh, and then we have our check boxes so that we go and make sure that those resources have incorporated that thing it helps to make a habit of continuously learning. Oh, yes. And lists for visuals, lists for audio. Yes. Lots of lists. <laughs> Hopefully they're all centralized though, because that's the other problem is things kind of disappear. And then you're, we, we use a lot of Google. So our, our, our Google Drive folders are getting uh, unmanageable at this point. And I should mention that we've been finding that our Google drives are getting so unmanageable that we're trying to put all the information now into press books. And uh, we are working on a training guide that hopefully will release within the next couple of months, which I think deals with some of these things that we've encountered. Uh, so sorry, it helps to make a habit of continuously learning about accessibility and inclusion. One cannot learn everything they need in a single training. Yes. And this is what we found you know, we would just get a resource done and we think we did a really good job. And then we're like, oh no, we missed this. <laughs> so it's, it's that constant need to improve, right? It's, and it's funny because, you know, we've had a lot of folks that we've worked with uh, on OERs and, you know, they'll say, I, you know, I'm not, especially because it's a 14 week turnaround They're, you know, sometimes they're not comfortable releasing. I don't know if you've encountered this yourselves, people feel very vulnerable about, you know, publishing their resources and because it might not be perfect yet, right? There's so much more they could do. 
And so we really have embraced that idea of not yetness. Uh, and, you know, a lot of times we'll even put that comment at the very beginning saying, hey, we're, we're, we're trying, we're doing the best we can, but we will be continually improving and evolving. And that really is the idea uh, of open. So that's the lovely piece. Starting with an accessible uh, template or resource is better than including it afterward. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, UDL can be improperly applied. It is easy to fall into the trap that UDL is another way to apply the myth of learning styles. UDL needs to be applied in a way that's intentionally beneficial. Yes. Oh, and thank you so much of, for these references. We'll take a look at those. Well, and we were talking about this earlier, Catherine and I, because... Yeah. Uh, in the very beginning, we thought everything had to be alt tagged. And, you know, every image we did in one book in particular has alt text, even though some of it was decorative. And now we know, um, you know, so that'll be another one that we need to go back and, and fix. Including individuals lived experience in evaluating, creating content. And this is a huge one. And, you know, and we've been lucky to have different students joining us um, with experience in this area. And so they've been able to give us some feedback on some of the resources that they've created. And that's the wonderful thing about working with students. Uh, we learn so much from them on a daily basis. And uh, sometimes just about how they learn and what they would like to see in a resource. And then obviously things that are in their own subject matter. This is wonderful. Thank you so much for all the, the feedback. Okay, and then question three, what resources have been helpful in your inclusive design journey? So we do mention the uh, accessibility toolkit later. This is definitely one to, to go to if you haven't seen it. Uh, accessibility and e-learning, what you need to know by the Council of Ontario University. I actually haven't seen that one, so thank you for sharing that. Making Ripples, a guidebook to challenges status quo and OER creation. Comprehensive Guide to Applying Universal Design. So some of these I actually haven't seen. So thank you. We'll, we'll be sure to check these out. So we'll leave the Google Doc up all throughout the session. So if you have anything else to add to it, please do. And please keep adding to the chat. If something even comes up in your mind and you think about it and you want to get it out, throw it in the chat. And we're going to proceed uh, on to our next slide. Over to you, Catherine. Um, so, um, as came up on the Google Doc, uh, we primarily build in press books, and we do want to highlight um, that checklist for accessibility from BC Campus, the Accessibility Toolkit Second Edition. Um, it's a great guide that that we've been using for for a long time now. Um, that kind of goes over all all those important elements for uh, accessibility headings, images, descriptive links tables, multimedia, math formulas, um, all that good stuff so when it comes to designing a book in Pressbooks. Um, so just for the sort of next little bit, um, we're just gonna share some of the challenges that we've encountered and some of our suggestions um, in terms of working with subject matter experts and um, sort of how we've gone about um, dealing with these, these challenges. So these situations might relate specifically to accessibility um, or they might be best practices for inclusivity. Um, and as Shauna mentioned, like, please feel free to um, contribute and, and jump in as well. We are always wanting to learn more. Um, so if you have a, um, some questions or some feedback or some great ideas, we'd love to hear them. Uh, we just highlighted sort of six areas um, to to go through. Uh, so color choice, consistency and structure, navigation, reference formatting, typography, and H5P interactives. Let's go to the first one here, um, which is color. How to ensure that color choices are suitable for all learners. Um, so of course you wanna make sure that there's a clear contrast between the colors. So background and a font, different colors that are on a graph, not using color to communicate meaning without other markers of meaning present. Um, color, um, if you have that color dependent information um, within an image or text, being sure that there's an alternative method of recognition, um, like a different pattern, and um, that the contrast could be adjusted by the user. So one of the areas that we um, 
went towards is designing a series of color palettes for faculty to choose from. So instead of letting um, them choose all their own individual colors, um, they can choose from a series of palettes. Um, so it, it helps them to make um, a decision around the colors. It's a little bit more simple than any color out there. Um, but we also know that there's um, color contrast and we've sort of done some of that work ahead of time um, so that when we're in that design, that really rapid design process, um, we've already done that, that pre-work uh, piece. I just want to jump in too, Catherine, because I don't know if anybody has encountered this, but it seems like people have a lot of, um, a lot of ideas around color. Yes, and they surely do. <laughs> it, it, we were spending a lot of time on this uh, discussion. And so, you know, having something they can choose from seems to make it a lot easier. It's one of the things we found, again, working with subject matter experts, if you provide too much choice, uh, it can be very overwhelming. So narrowing the choice down to some options can be really good. Yeah. Thanks, Catherine. So the second challenge is consistency. So um, finding the balance between a unique design for each resource and then consistency across resources. Um, so a consist consistency in layout allows students to find information really quickly, um, make sure that the content is arranged in a logical order, meaningful names are used for features in the resource, um, and that the, the resource is readable. So what... Um, the, the process that we currently have, we're very consistent in terms of navigation features. So our books feature chapter outlines. Uh, we handle references and the reference placement in the same way in all the books. The front matter and back matter are pretty standardized. Um, we do use the standard text box styles um, within Pressbooks, but for a lot of our books, we've also included custom icons or custom text boxes, depending on the content. And this is a way um, that we're able to work with a subject matter expert and their content to make their book a little bit unique and, and sort of stand out. Um, so we've provided some of the custom icons in his picture. Um, and one of my favorite ones is the, the fourth one, which is the smiley face with the, the not in the tongue. Um, and it was from a Spanish book that we did. And so to practice their pronunciation, the author included tongue twisters in Spanish um, throughout the book. And so um, every time they saw this icon, it was a little opportunity for them to practice um, sort of a, in a fun kind of crazy way. And so we have a fun icon to match with that that they could look for um, throughout throughout the book. And I just want to say here too, another another thing I was thinking about as well, Catherine, after we did the slides was we got some feedback uh, very early on when we were doing our resources from some students because we were doing uh, student reviews. And it seemed like consistently in the books where, you know, we took the chapter as the part, we always get confused about this, even when we're explaining it to our students <laughs> working with us. So in press books, the chapter for us is the part, and then the chapters are the chapter sections. So we'll have kind of chapter one, and then it broken out into 1.1, 1.2, 1 1.3 in terms of numbering. And uh, a lot of the students that were reviewing the textbook came back and said they really liked that format uh, because, you know, if they were engaging with the content, say, on the bus or at home, maybe they were multitasking, and maybe they only had a set amount of time. So they knew exactly where they left off in their reading. It was like, yeah, I left off on 1.3. I'm going to jump back in later and finish off the chapter. And I know where to start. And so that really did drive our design choice as well in terms of how the book was, the book was structured. And it, again, it allows it to be nicely chunked uh, as well. Because sometimes, you know, they talk about, okay, if you're going beyond a heading four, you know, mm -hmm. you should go to the next section but it didn't always work out that way. So kind of having that natural um, place to kind of chunk and put it over into the next uh, press books uh, chapter uh, was really helpful. Are there other ways too people are making uh, design choices for consistency? I know we've been talking a lot about press books because that's where we largely uh, develop our resources, mm -hmm. but are there any, any other thoughts of what you're doing for consistency? 
And thank you, Danielle, for sharing that resource. I'll be sure to check that one out. So we found two icons, you know, can help people yeah. uh, in addition to the text boxes so that they have that kind of visual cue that, you know, maybe they have to do something or maybe it's a question, uh, but having that consistent layout, key terms, mm -hmm. you know, listed at the back. We've played around mm -hmm. too with different things in terms of using tooltips, not using tooltips. People mm -hmm. seem to prefer just having a key terms list because that way students could even copy and paste that or print that page out if they were studying content for that chapter mm -hmm. as well. Creating style guides yes. is very helpful. Yes. This is something we yeah. never even thought to include, Harper, but we do this. <laughs> and it's funny because what we found, and I don't know if other people have found this, we tried projects where we started with a style guide or we call a design guide at the beginning, and then it just kept changing and evolving. So now we wait till we're like one or two chapters in and we see the content coming in and how it's flowing and then how it's, you know, kind of working out and then go back and, you know, kind of create that consistency so that it flows through. We just had this in a book because the one we're doing right now, the faculty member had so many different ideas for different yeah. boxes. I was just thinking of that example, actually. Yeah. And how helpful the style guide became for that. Yeah. Yeah. Because the naming we, convention changed, remember? Like, yes. Same yes. Box, but the naming convention, like, it was like tips or then points to remember. So, to, to make it consistent, we had to have that guide. Yeah. Yeah. It was very helpful because you'd go in, because um, again, our design guides, they sort of do that evolution. So, you go in to add, oh, I just made a new box, you go in to add it, and you're like, wait, points to consider, like, elements to consider. Those are the, those are the same thing. They should be the same box. And so it um, helped us to sort of collapse sort of the number of things and make things just a little bit more, more streamlined. Yeah. So the next uh, piece is um, Pressbooks navigation or more broadly, how to ensure um, that digital tools are easy to navigate. So important to remember that not everybody knows how to navigate all the types of di different digital tools that we encounter. Um, and this is this is something that we're just, um, this is one of our newest um, elements actually, because of course we're so, so deep into press books that we forget that it's brand new for a lot of people that are encountering it. Um, and Pressbooks also has options for alternative formats. So you can, you know, download different uh, PDF styles and things like that. So um, we're looking at uh, what BC Campus and Open Oregon have in terms of navigation instructions at the beginning of the book. Um, and they also include a table on the different alternative formats and, and what are the sort of pros and cons of each and how you can use them. Um, so we're actually right now working on drafting our own set of navigation instructions. Um, and so uh, once we get that ready, we'll put it into all of our new products. But again, uh, add, it, add it to our ever evolving spreadsheet and take some time to go back um, and update all of our, our previous ones as well so that um, this this element is, is in there. Um, so we did get some feedback from users um, talking about this and so um, are going to going to work to include it moving moving forward. So challenge number four um, is looking at reference formatting. Should online ebook versions include accessible links in their reference lists? So um, Jen Booth at Georgian had asked a question around APA formats and digital materials and descriptive links. And this sparked a big conversation in our studio. Um, and so we've got a APA style guide on accessible links um, link there. And um, the way we decided to go is that um, the title of the reference is the descriptive link. And then the URL is just put in at the end, not linked. And um, this is one of the lovely little programs that Shauna had mentioned by one of our amazing students, Jason Benoit. Um, so he had already created a program for us 
to make formatting reference lists easier. Um, so it adds that um, indent, puts the references in alphabetical order for you. Um, and he's now modified it and updated it um, so that the titles are now descriptive links. So um, we've got the little program on our GitHub page uh, open for, for anyone, of course, that uh, would like to make use of this. Um, Nice little, nice little program. So uh, the fifth, fifth challenge, uh, typography. So capitalization, bolding, italics, etc. cetera. Um, of course, you want to use a dyslexic friendly font, um, avoiding the all caps or the small caps, using underlining only for links. Um, we found out that Pressbooks themes actually default to caps in the in their titles. Um, so now we have a little CSS code that we have on the screen there um, that you, you put into all the books to change that um, uh, out of all caps. Um, we receive a lot of questions from faculty sort of surrounding italics, capitalization, bolding, underlining, and we, we have been finding either from references that we're using and adapting or even um, certain like authors that we're working with, uh, they often are putting in these sort of elements to express their voice. And so it is a little bit of working with them to sort of standardize that and make sure that these elements are being used clearly um, and not just for um, sort of visual interests or, um, you know, if they want to highlight something that we will highlight it in a certain way um, so that it's very clear. So for example, um, key terms. So we've, we go through our books and make sure that bolding is only used for key terms. It's bolded in the first substantial reference to the term and there's a definition. So these elements are all present. Um, and this will be one of the pieces that we're going to be putting into our navigation instructions um, to let the, the reader know that key term will be bolded, you can expect um, to have a, a, a definition for it. And here's where to find that um, definition. Um, and our final um, piece here is H5P interactives and ensuring um, how to handle H5Ps and um, ensuring that they are accessible. So a lot of H5P's uh, formats are actually not accessible um, and they require workarounds. So uh, we have, and Sean has been adding the links there to include some of the best practices on how to use H5P and um, some of the workarounds. So one example is the documentation tool. Um, very popular with a lot of our, with our subject matter experts, um, but it does have limitations when it's magnified. Um, and so we have included as recommended by the best practice, just a little note explaining um, that this is, this is an issue. So please note if this page is magnified above 200% when completing the reflective activity below, the navigation buttons on the left and the export button may overlap. Um, not a, perfect fix, obviously, but at least um, will give uh, people interacting with this activity a little bit of um, forewarning and, and context. Um, one other uh, element that we did is one of our faculty actually worked on a book um, in collaboration with Conestoga um, and what the, um, how the OER, our OER librarian there did is actually provided text-based um, alternatives for all the H5Ps in the book. Um, so these, of course, could be could be all read out and you don't need that interactivity um, piece of it and uh, would obviously show up nicely in the print uh, PDF as well. I just wanted to add too, I, I added it to the uh, chat under best practices. But uh, this this guide is really excellent uh, if it will load <laughs> on my computer. I probably have too many links open, uh, but it goes through 
the different H5P types mm -hmm. and uh, codes them based on which ones are, are good without workarounds, which ones need workarounds and um, which ones they suggest, you know, not to use. And this was from the academic Senate for the California community colleges. Now I will say there's been a couple of different uh, accessibility reviews of H5P that have been done and they don't always agree. So this is where things uh, become a bit challenging as well. Uh, because I know in one of them, it said hot spots are okay. And then another one said hot spots are definitely not okay. So trying to kind of figure this piece out, um, it's good to work, you know, if you have accessibility lab folks uh, that can test out some of these things uh, that can be really helpful uh, as well. Um, but it will, if you click on it, and this is where we had learned about the documentation mm -hmm. tool issue. Uh, it'll say usable with workarounds. And then it's quite lovely because it'll, uh, fill you in on uh, what you need to do um, to make it to make it usable. Has anybody else encountered any issues with H5P and accessibility at all? And maybe some possible workarounds that you that you have done? Feel free to, to unmute yourselves if you if you have had that experience. This is definitely one area that it's it's really tricky mm -hmm. because a lot of people really love H5P and love that interactivity. Yeah. Uh, and so you want to, again, make sure you're balancing that with allowing everybody to to participate, um, to participate in that. Oh, Harper, that would be fantastic if you come up with anything. We have some code, uh, CSS code that we add in so that when the print version happens, the, uh, which one is it? The digital PDF, I think, you yeah. know, it will show kind of the H5P. We just, we create it so that it doesn't show that piece, uh, which is helpful, but it would, again, be nice to have the text version in there. Mm -hmm. Has anyone found other tools to use for interactivities? There was another one, Gail, that, uh, and I can't think of the name of it, Catherine, that uh, people were using, oh, uh, but it, um, you had to have a license for it again. I'm trying to remember. Oh, it's slipping my mind right now. If I think about it, I'll e email it out. I know that at top of my- we, we had a whole conversation. Yeah, we did look Sorry. at it and there's there were things that people had created in there, uh, but we needed to to get a license so we couldn't. Yeah, it wasn't Rise. Oh, uh, yeah, it wasn't Storyline. It was another, like, just kind of standalone product, kind of similar to H5P, but it had a lot more of kind of a better user interface. It was much easier mm -hmm. to use. Can't think of the name of it, though. Anyway, that is the end of our presentation, our formal presentation. And these are just a couple of examples of things that, you know, we've encountered. Obviously, we're encountering lots of different things every day. Uh, so please feel free to keep adding to the Google Doc. And please reach out too, if you wanna continue to have a conversation around this, we we love to hear from people. And especially if there's things that you have figured out, I'm even thinking, Laura, maybe it would be good to have a an accessibility chat within the open library chat. Maybe we could start sharing some ideas there too.